Okay, so um, welcome everybody to our 14th round now and last round before the summer break um, of the CMFI MassSpec seminar series. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really fun to have um, Absar here today. So she, Absar is a, is a PhD student um, in our lab and yeah, she has a pretty interesting background. She studied uh, medical photonics very much focused on Raman spectroscopy, but then decided that mass spec might be also a cool technology to use. And yeah, her um, focus is like a, a little bit on the data science side and, and she's very talented and it's been super fun to, to work with her so far on that. So yeah, like that being said, uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look actually at like the data structure of the feature tables that we generated before. And we wanna in particular um, show you how we like clean up that data and get it ready for like some first multivariate um, analysis. So yeah, that being said, um, what we're going to use is kind of like a little ping pong match between Excel and R. So fortunately, to quote uh, Mike Meehan, uh, I've been um, uh, successfully using Excel for, for many years and I think I control it quite well. And I think it's a very intuitive tool um, to also like explain certain things. On the other hand, uh, it's not very efficient and scalable. So like, I'm very happy that Upsir can do this much better in R. So hence we wanna show you a little bit um, both ends um, of how to process data. And then the latest, once we move on to like multivariate analysis, this will be completely in R because you can't do much in, in Excel anymore. So now, yeah, we sent you around um, like two links yesterday. Um, and for like the hands-on part, I would uh, suggest that you like open both. They're like in the in the email upstream. Maybe you can also copy the link um, quickly in the chat. So in case people did not get that email. And yeah, those links will bring you like to the test data, especially for like the Excel um, exercise, you will, you will need the CSV files there. And it also uh, gives you a, a link to like the Google Colab, um, which is basically a Jupyter notebook for the R code. Um, APSA wrote, which we will then um, go step by step through for the rest um, of the um, seminar today. And yeah, like in a nutshell, what we're going to do is we're going to inspect the feature table. So this is basically one of the output files you got from uh, uh, from Robin when he processed the LCMS MS data with MZ-3. And what this basically is, it's just like a, a single table or a matrix or a data frame that has uh, rows and columns, obviously. And in each row, there is the peak intensities for a particular feature, right? And then like in the columns, this is basically um, indicating then like the different samples, right? And then like, how like this peak intensity was like in these samples. And then throughout the, the seminar, we will basically do multiple steps um, with this feature table. So we will we'll first remove all the features that we think were like significantly high in our planks, so might be background features. Um, then we will do an imputation step where we're gonna remove all the zero peak areas. So this is particularly some consequences for some statistical analysis we may wanna do later. And then we will also normalize um, like the peak areas to get a, a kind of relative abundance per sample. So, and then from there, um, we're going to perform like a principal coordinate analysis. So this is basically a dimensional reduction where we now create principal components that display multiple features, right? So we put multiple variables, uh, variables into now different categories, so-called principal components. And then, yeah, we can like display them and see how much of the variance will be explained within these principal components. And then typically, display the two first principal components in such like a, um, a Pico Ace uh, plot uh, before we then gonna do some other statistical tests and ask actually the questions, what metadata categories like could be like responsible for separation of our samples. So this will be a, a PERMANOVA analysis. But yeah, to, to jump right in, uh, I would suggest let's uh, open our um, yeah like spreadsheet program. So I personally uh, use uh, uh, Microsoft uh, um, Excel a lot, but you can also use like Google Sheets as a as an open source alternative or Open Office, whatever you have on on your computer to basically um, yeah explore and and modify like such uh, spreadsheets. 
And then, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to go to this uh, URL like I provided to you, or apps are also hopefully just copied in the, um, in the chat. And then you will see here is the overview of like the different test data files apps are loaded um, onto our GitHub here. And when you go one step back to actually here, CMFI seminar, uh, multivariate statistics, um, then when you click here on code, you can download the entire repository as a zip uh, file. So I did this here already. Yeah, so it basically uh, like downloads this compressed and then you can, you can extract this. And then what you uh, should have is, um, yeah, here a folder with like um, different subfolders, one of which should be test data. Okay, so now once you did that and you have this folder in front of you, you should see that there is um, a bunch of like different files. And this is way more than we need today. Just to be complete, we, we kind of like put in like all the outputs from MZMine, such as like the MGF file. So this would be typically something we need then for feature-based molecular networking um, or serious. But now all we're gonna use for the Excel part is actually like the two CSV files. And there's one gap filled and one non-gap filled. And like later on, I, I will show you why um, we actually need both. But yeah, to do that, so that's a CSV file. So it should be um, straightforward to open this with Excel. If it doesn't recognize the file type, maybe open Excel and like drag and drop the CSV file into it. But uh, one way or the other, it should it should like open it, you know, and then you may need to like still split like the columns with like the commas, the eliminator, but normally it, it recognizes it already. And then you get this matrix. And it's on, on the initial slide. What you should see is nicely that, yeah, like you have here like the different rows, right? And you can see there's a row ID or what would correspond to our scan number in the MGF. Then there is an MZ value, so that's the mass. And then there's the retention time. And then there are some other rows here. Um, those are mainly uh, things from ion identity molecular networking, but for today, for um, the ease of use, we will just like remove them because like all I'm interested in is now like yeah, MZ and retention time and the index. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert here a new column and actually create only one name for like this feature table in which I um, concatenate like the three different like numbers here. So therefore this we could then call just like feature name also, you know, and then here um, use now in Excel the concatenate function. So in case you haven't used function, it's basically just pretty simple. You say uh, equals and then type the name of the function and then um, it yeah like uh, already like autofills it. So here um, yeah we use the concat function for example, and then if I double click on it, it fills it. And then like what I can do is I can simply define variables to be concatenated. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the row ID as my first one. Then I wanna have this separated by actually an underscore. So I need to put this underscore here in quotation marks. And then I'm gonna put the next variable and then again, underscore in quotation marks. And then the third variable and that's it. And then what we should get here is a feature name that now contains like, yeah, like the um, three uh, basically numbers here. So this would be row ID, um, MZ and retention time. And now in order to do this to like my full matrix, I just like go to like the um, lower right um, of the cell and then double click in there. And then it should just uh, um, downfill this to like the full matrix. And if I go to the end of the matrix at the very bottom, you will see, okay, it actually um, did this. All right, so now we have here our, um, yeah, like feature table. And then now in the um, other columns, you will see we will have um, like all like the different samples. And at the very beginning, you can see already there is one that is called plank. And it also has this weird suffix called uh, peak area, 
which kind of like um, is like um, the typical format from MZMine, but it's a little bit annoying for us. So I try to remove this. I will do this by actually just selecting like this string, and then uh, I will use the replace function um, here with this uh, find and replace in Excel. So it's Control F um, as a shortcut, and then I will put in this term under replace, and then just say replace all, and then you will see it made like 42 replacements. So now all the headers, you know, they don't have this anymore. If you don't do it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just as fine, but you know, it, it just makes it a little bit more slim and nicely to investigate. So now the next step, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like sort already a little bit my samples here. And that has the particular reason that in the next step of plank removal, I kind of wanna have the planks and my samples being separated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert here two columns and then I'm going to move this other plank here to the front, you know, delete this column and I yeah, perhaps leave one as a space. So now I have nicely here my planks separated from the rest of the samples. And I'm going to do this um, by also like highlighting it here in gray, for example, and then the rest in green mainly for visualization purpose. So now you know, okay, there's there's two types of categories, planks and actual samples. And this is really important because I wanna use these two planks to basically decide whether a feature is actually from my sample or as like some background from the extraction or from like the um, data acquisition. And with that in mind, I can now add into this table um, a binary um, delimiter that actually tells me whether something was found in the plank or if it was only found in the sample or mainly found in the sample. And to do that, we're gonna include here a new column. And what I first gonna do is simply the ratio of plank versus sample, okay? And what I'm gonna do here is I, again, gonna use a function and then I will simply build the average here was this average function um, of the planks. And then I will divide this average by the average of all samples, right? So then this would be all the rest here. If you wonder how I fill this um, directly to the end, I uh, press control and shift and then the cursor to the right. And then it kind of like fills this completely. You can also do this down or like down and right to get a full matrix. So some, some Excel tricks in case you don't know. Um, anyway, now if I have defined basically here, like these two groups, I just press enter and then you will see I get the value 1.11. So now what does that mean? That means actually that the average in my planks here is higher than the average in my samples. So this thing probably would be a background feature and not really coming from my plank, uh, from my samples. So now, again, I'm gonna fill this down by double clicking at the lower right of the cell. And then you will see when we scroll through, yeah, in many um, situations here, this number will be really small or even here divide by zero because um, there was just like zero values found in the samples, um, which we don't really want either. So I could basically expand here my column and quickly adding like a one as a, just as a number, right? So I would need to put new brackets around this in order to avoid dividing by zero. And then you will see that yeah, it doesn't really change much the actual values, but now I don't have this divide by zero problem anymore. And just for, uh, I also won't get any zeros, but I get really small numbers. So now uh, we could of course go through and look at these numbers, but we wanna do this perhaps like more systematically and just like ask the question, okay, was this number higher than a certain threshold? And now what is a good threshold? Well, I don't know. Like we typically use something between 10 and 30%, but this depends a lot of like um, on your samples and also how kind of stringent um, you wanna be with this removal step. So as a rule of thumb, we use 30%, but yeah, I think this is there. I don't have a right or wrong answer for you. 
But now if we would want to do that, right? So we could use this um, plank uh, flag, you know, uh, or binary information, and then give it a one or a zero whether this was in the plank or not. Okay, so to do that again, I'm gonna call a function. Now in this case, we're gonna use if. So if, then open bracket. And then we simply say, okay, if this value here is greater than 0 0.3, which would correspond to 30%, then flag this as a one. And if not, then as a zero. And yeah, basically separate this here with the uh, with commas. Then I close the bracket and then you will see, okay, in this case, well, it's 1.11. Uh, so it's indeed bigger than, than, um, uh, than uh, 0 0.3. So this would be the case, right? So now again, I just kind of fill this down, you know, and now when we go down, you will see there's many ones, but there's also now many zeros, especially if I go farther down. So now, what we could do here is we could simply delete now everything that has a one. But what I think is a better way is to actually only copy the ones that not have a one and then move them through, uh, through a new um, sheet actually. To do this, I'm gonna here um, now insert like um, a filter. So this is here on the home and then sort and filter. I insert this filter option. And now what I can do is I can simply um, here filter and only display things that have a zero, right? And now from here, my feature name onwards, I'm gonna mark now the full matrix. I'm gonna copy this. And then I'm gonna generate a new sheet, which I will call um, blanks removed. And then I'll paste this in. And now as we have the planks removed, you know, I don't really need um, like the planks or samples here and like just flags anymore because I know already this is all planks removed. So I will just delete those columns. And now what I'm left with is basically a new matrix that has now this feature name as a concatenated uh, only one column. And then um, here actually all my peak areas, but only from those features that were not significantly abundant in the uh, planks. And yeah, I think with that, I'm gonna play it over to Absir, who's now gonna show you how to do that like a little bit more faster and reproducible in R. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everybody. My name is Absir. Like, thank you, Daniel, for introducing me. So now all of us can go to this GitHub page. And from here, I we can go into the like uh, collab, Google collab page. You can just click on this open in collab. So and then click on the Jupyter notebook that we have created for the Google collab. And then it opens our Jupyter notebook. So um, Jupyter Notebook usually works with Python and we have, uh, but, but there are also, you can also run it in R. Same way Google Collab especially runs with Python and uh, yeah, since our notebook is in R, it also runs. So like I have specified the authors and uh, Daniel also like uh, gave uh, many insightful ideas. So if you guys have any doubt with the script, you guys can uh, ask us like writers, we are uh, uh, happy to help. And these are the dependencies. These are the libraries which we need to run the script um, like ggplot2, dplir, ecodisk, vegan, and svg lite. And I've mentioned here why we need this particular packages. This we would get to uh, in the later sessions. And yeah, so first of all, we need to do certain things while we are running it in Google Collab or even in Jupyter Notebook is that we need to install the necessary packages. We need to call the packages and then you need to set a working directory where your files are there and that way you can uh, perform your uh, stuff easily and store it there and yeah, and then run whatever you wanna do. So I would just simply click here, run anyways. and it installs the packages. 
while it's installing, we can also go and uh, upload the file here if you would like to, because in Google Collab or maybe not for this uh, session, but later when you want to try it by yourself, you can quickly go and um, just like that, maybe pick somewhere and you can just uh, create a new folder and upload all the test files here. But since we are doing it um, now in this Google session, I would just uh, simply call it from the GitHub. Yeah, it's taking a while to install all the packages. So there's also one more uh, um, like application like Binder, which can also run your um, uh, notebooks, like let it be in Python or R in an interactive session. So this is helpful because you don't need to actually download the Jupyter Notebook and run it in your local environment. You can just run it in a like interactive way. So now it's all installed, then we can just call all our packages and then we can set a working directory, but now I'm not gonna do this working directory stuff. We can just directly go and um, call the files from the GitHub. So these are the e URL links for the files. And then we are just gonna um, read the files, the CSV files. So NFT is non gap filled, FT is uh, gap filled feature table and MD is our metadata. And this is basically what Daniel uh, did. Uh, so he opened the files and I'm gonna just show you guys a glimpse of what's in the data. And here we call it a data frame because of course it contains numeric information and like um, categorical information. Yes. So, the, so we, here we see a small, um, like this is six rows of what's in our data. It has like 5,807 um, rows, which are like the features and 56 columns. Same way we can run it and see for the non gap fill data as well as for the metadata. And then we can uh, run this next cell. So what this cell contains is like, it just removed the PKDA extensions as he showed, especially it's important for us because we are going to call all these uh, feature table uh, columns using the metadata. So it's important that we both have the same names when we call it. That's why we remove these extensions and we check if both these names are the same. And also there are some NA columns present. We are also removing that, like I can quickly show. Not these NA columns, but there are some NA columns like empty column, which is full of NA values. So sometimes it happens and we are like removing these empty columns and then we're changing the row names as he mentioned, combining the first three uh, row ID, row MC and row retention time for the feature tables. And for the metadata, we are calling the file name as the row name. And then, yeah, we're just going to fix the MCML uh, files so that our data frame has only numeric data. Like instead of deleting it, I'm just, as he said, instead of like deleting these, I'm just picking the ones with the MCML extensions in it. So yeah, let's run it. And it's done. And now we can see as you see in the non gap filled uh, feature table, like as he showed earlier, like the row names have been changed. And here we have um, the files. So the next step is to split our data into blanks and um, controls and the samples, as he showed earlier. So here I created a, a function called frequency plot, which basically uh, that's what he showed. It uh, arranges your data into bins and then, yeah, I can show you. So you just run. And then now here we are going to split it. I call it as I call the feature table as input data because I didn't want to work with the, I didn't want to change the initial file. So then this is my favorite part. <laughs> 
So it shows you a basic idea of what's near data, metadata. And then these are like the attributes that we have in our metadata. So here, enter the index of the attribute to split sample and control. So when you create your metadata, you know which column has that information. So since we created the metadata, I created the metadata, the information is in the second at, um, column, which is like the at attribute sample type. So I'm giving in the index value, which is two. And then these are the like levels, which are inside that, as you can see here, without treatment, with treatment. And also there's one blank, like one level. There are two files in blank. I'm entering the index of my blank. So I have chosen blank as my blanks. And that's it, it has already split it. So here we can see, like the control is, it has split it as like um, my two blanks and the samples are, yeah, the rest of the 40 columns. And so that's basically what I did manually, right? When yeah. I separated the two. So we're also removing the blanks, right? So then another cell, you just say, do you want to perform blank removal? Yes or no? And I'm going to say yes. And as he already mentioned you guys about the cutoff, I'm going to give a cutoff value of 0 0.3. And then it's performed as well. And the number of background noise features is 1311. And these are like after excluding them. So yeah, just to show you guys the dimension because now the dimension has reduced uh, from the original dimension. Now this is like 4,400 something, but it's like the original ones had like 5,800 and features. So the rest of noise features we have removed it now. So with that, I would hand it over to Daniel again. All right. Thanks a lot, Absir. And yeah, like to those of you who try to follow, so if you click on that collab link, you can just click through. So like all the cells, they should just like run on your computer without doing anything. And, and I hope it's it's easy to follow. I know that's a lot of um like code in there, but like they're nicely organized themselves. So it should be hopefully easy to follow. Um, and what I also hope is that like you see the parallels, you know, how we do the same thing in Excel and now more streamlined in R. And yeah, like if we would now ask the question, so Upster I think had 4,496 features left, right? So now technically, because the math was the same, if I would count all the rows here, you know, you would see, oh yeah, it's also 4,496. So the data frame I have now in here is basically the same than uh, what apps are just generated. All right, so now again, so we have here the different peak areas, right, of my different samples now. So no more, no more planks. And then, yeah, those are like, um, just like some values and you will see that some of them are also zeros. Okay, so I personally don't like zeros there. So we struggled already like uh, um, earlier when we did like this flagging with, you know, that we can't divide by zero, for example. So anything we're going to do now downstream that is like ratio based, or if we want to do some like log transformations, you know, those zero values gonna like um, disturb us. Another thing why I don't like um, zeros is kind of like a question of uncertainty, right? So like working with mass spectrometry or any other analytical technique, we have a certain dynamic range. So this is basically the range um, of concentration in which we can like detect a certain molecule. So now once like the molecule concentration is below that range, you know, or like below the limit of detection or LOD, um, yeah, we basically get a zero here because there is no uh, peak area anymore, you know, and it's just like a, a, a zero value. Now the question is, is that real? Is there really like nothing or is this just like below the LOD? So something that I would like much better is kind of like the, you know, being a uh, devil's advocate and say, yeah, that's not zero, it's just below LOD. So hence what, what I like to do, and I know there's many different ways to do, and I also don't know what's the perfect one, but I think that's at least what makes most sense to me is to replace the zeros with a value that we would consider LOD. 
And that process is called imputation. So it's often done like for, for other like um, omics sciences, particularly um, mass spectrometry based proteomics. It's like a, it's a, it's a huge thing and there's many different ways, but yeah, let's, let's for now just do like that most simple one and, and replace it with the LOD. Now, of course, the question is, what is that LOD? And I make the assumption here that I simply pick the smallest peak area in that full data frame that was naturally detected, so not gap filled. And that's why we also had this non-gap filled feature table in the test data. So now in order to get that and inspect that, I just the same way as I did it before, you know, I will now go here to like this um, uh, non-gap filled um, quant table. And then it should also open it in Excel. And now what I'm gonna look at is just like a distribution of all the features in here. And you see, okay, this is non-gap filled. There is way more zeros now, right? Um, so yeah, like how do we do that? So in Excel, there is like this function called frequency, which I'm gonna use. And in order to use this, we need to define bins. So this is basically like the size of categories in which we wanna like bin this data. And let's, for example, say, okay, um, Let's go from zero to, uh, you know, one to 10 to 100 and so on. And to speed this up, I will write a quick function to like just multiply by 10, you know, and then I will make here like my, my different bins. So now once I have these categories, I can now on the side basically ask, okay, how many of this matrix, how many features fall into these bins? And therefore I select like here the full um, kind of like list and then write into like the formula field equals frequency. And you see it already popping up here. So frequency function. And now when we read, we first need to specify our data array. So this would be the feature table. And then we need to define the bin categories. So to do that, I just go here on my full feature table and again, with control shift and the cursors, I navigate quickly to select this full uh, matrix here. And then I'm gonna separate this by comma. And then next, I'm gonna now select here like this bins beside that. Then I'm gonna close the brackets. And now very important, this is an array function in Excel. And in order to execute this, I need to, again, push uh, control shift at the same time with enter. And then when I do that, you see that there is now, you know, like the frequencies of feature areas or peak areas um, display that fall into that bin, right? And now in order to visually display that quickly, I'm just gonna insert here a bar plot and then specify um, the data. You know, so let's here use the bins and then define also here the names for the for the categories. And then you will see, oh, okay, most of it is actually zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna display this in log scale. Okay, and then we will see, yeah, like so the smallest peak area was somewhere between thousand and ten thousand. Um, to be accurate, I looked it up before. Um, it was 3,766. So now 3,766 was basically the smallest value that we detected as a peak during the feature finding step. So now I go back to my other table here. And what I basically now wanna do is I wanna um, check whether a value was bigger than this uh, 3,766. And if it was the case, I will keep it. And if not, everything that is smaller, I will fill up to the value 3,766. So how am I gonna do that? Again, we're gonna use the if function here. So yeah, I'm a big fan of the, of the if function. And um, yeah, we kind of just copy here the headers of this matrix and generate a new one just right next to it. Okay, so now this one here, I also make it like yellow so we see directly that this is different and now what i'm going to do is in the first cell i will say equals if and now i will ask the question is this value here 
on again the, the first um, sample. Oops, uh, let's go back. So if is this value here greater than 3766? And if that's the case, then I will display just the variable of the cell. So I just say, okay, here, click on the cell. And if not, I will um, print the value 3766. So I think I need to write this in uh, quotation marks. So it takes it, okay. And then let's see. Okay, and now indeed, in this case here, you know, it was bigger than 3766. So it displayed it. But now if I, you know, pull this down, you will see, oh, many of them are now filled here with 3,766, where before there was a zero or where before there was a smaller value than this, than this value, okay? So now, yeah, we basically have this here. I can also pull this to the right and then fill it down and perform this operation for my full matrix. So then I have to go till 4,497. Yes, Ta -da. and let's see, let's take a little while. But yeah, now I kind of have the same table here. I'm gonna make all yellow so you see it very clearly. You know, as on the other side, just like all the zeros and all the peak areas below 3,766 have been filled up um, to like 3,766. So now as I did it before, I'm gonna copy this and uh, paste this now into a new sheet. So I maintain a little bit like the steps uh, I performed here. And now when I paste this, I right click and say paste values because if I would paste the formulas, you know, it, it would not find the original values. And then what I also gonna do, I gonna copy here my first column for the feature names. And now nicely, we have a new matrix that is plank removed and am imputated. And yeah, with that, I'm gonna play it back to Absar and she's gonna show you now how to do those, those steps also in her script. Thank you, Daniel. So now I'm basically going to just press one cell. And so now we are taking this blank removed, uh, sorry, blank removal one as gap filled and the NFT data frame, and I'm calling it as non -ga not gap filled. And then I'm going to run the other cell, which basically does what Daniel explained. So one second. Okay, do you want to perform imputation with minimum value of non gap filled table? Yes. And yeah, it's done. And here you can see the output. The minimum value greater than zero for gap filled is 123, whereas, like for not gap filled, it is 3,766. And also in the plot, you can see that. As he showed, like in the gap field, it's here, whereas in the not gap field, it's in the range of um, thousands. So yeah, thousand to uh, 10,000. So basically we have replaced all of these values here with 3,766, as he mentioned. So we can just, you can also save this, like write this table if you want. And I would quickly also write it and you can also see just like the header six rows to see if it's like I hope you guys are also following the notebook so you can see that it's been replaced okay one second so we are in the content folder here so if you go see it's supposed to so, yeah so it's here sorry guys I read uh, earlier created a like folder and it has the working directory. So you can see that it has already saved the file that I um, did, quant table filled with minimum value. So it shows like, okay, I have filled this table with this minimum value 3,766. 
So yeah, I like plotted this with a function called frequency plot. So if you guys are like doing this, I just wanted to mention that earlier, um, yeah, I earlier you might have run this plot and some like some who doesn't know might have wondered that it didn't give any output. So it's just a function that I created. So every time we use this function called frequency plot, it's going to do whatever that's inside the cell. So I just wanted to mention that. And with that, imputation is done. And now I would, one second, so imputation is done. Yeah. With that, I'd hand it back to Daniel. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Absur. So now, yeah, we come back now to our um, Excel table here. So yeah, we kind of have the same thing now um, as Absur just did. And now there's just one step uh, left before we then want to like move on with like the multivariate analysis. And that last one is normalization. So now um, we basically have kind of like um, yeah, like absolute values. So like in, in, in terms of like peak area here. And what I want to do in the next step is basically I want to normalize this to TIC. So TIC stands for total ion current. So that's basically the sum of all peak areas per sample. And then, yeah, simply display this value as a percentage or as like parts per million or whatever, right? And in order to do that, um, we're going to include now a new row here. And yeah, before we normalize, we first need to build the sum of all features per sample. And then, yeah, we simply call this new column and this new row here TIC. And then we would call like here the sum function. So this is simply sum. And then in bracket, we will now define all peak areas per sample. So again, I press control shift and cursor down, and then it should mark the full row here in Excel. And then if we go up and yeah, close this with brackets and hit enter, then I should get the value, right? And now I just pull this to the right. So I do it for all samples. Um, and now here on the top, you see I have um, the TIC. This is also a very nice way to kind of like quickly check if some of your samples were missed injections, because if your some peak area is significantly lower um, in one sample than in the others, it, it might mean that there was not much material injected. If you have very different samples, like a low and high biomass, this could also be like something natural, but let's say if everything here is like um, from the same strain or like all is blood samples, then more or less like that TIC value should be the same. Um, anyway, so now in order to, to create like the normalized table, what I'm gonna do is again, I'm gonna copy here the headers and I'm gonna generate here a new matrix just right next to it. Again, now I'm gonna make this purple. Oh wait, you don't see that, let's make it green. Um, and then I again gonna use the if, no, let's see. Um, then again, I'm gonna use a function to uh, basically uh, normalize this and it's not the if function. Okay, so how am I gonna do that? Like, I just gonna select here the cell and then it's actually super simple. Like all I gonna do is gonna divide this by the sum, right? And now if I would wanna have percent, I would multiply it by a hundred. Or if I wanna like have parts per million, I would multiply it by 1 million. In our case, I just built like the ratio by the sum and then we get something between zero and one, right? So that's, I think like the same, but you can do it however you want. The only thing which is really important in Excel is that now um, if I fill this down, it will of course always move like the two cells. So for like the second cells that defines the TIC, you know, I'm gonna put a dollar sign in front of like the two so that this height, so like the row remains static for the row two. Okay, and then I just hit um, enter. And then you see, okay, now I get a way smaller value because this is normalized to um, like the sum, you know, and now if I fill this down, you know, then I will get like this. And then I can again, fill this also to the right. Let's see, 
uh, yeah, I made one too many. And then I will now have here my normalized table. To do a quick sanity check, I can simply um, expand like the TIC row here to those. And then oh, technically this should be around one. I think yeah, there is some rounding issue, but you know, if I will only display this with one decimal, then it should be um, around one. All right. Um, cool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this. And again, paste this into a new field, again, as values. And then also I'm going to bring in here the uh, names. And then I can remove that TIC column. And now technically I have a TIC normalized matrix here. And yeah, with that, I'm going to play it back to Absur, and she's going to do that last step in R. So for the normalization, so like we have done it until imputed. Now I just, so I already run it. So that's why it's showing tick, but like usually just run it and then it runs. And do you want to perform normalization? All these steps are the same way as Zanet explained earlier. So I just say yes. And yeah, it just shows that there are like no NA values in the normalized data. And yeah, it's done. You can also save it. And I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, you can also see that the file is also now saved. So the next step we are going to, so now the data is ready. We are going to do like PCA and some Fermino analysis before uh, jumping into the principal coordinate analysis. I would just, give you guys a small introduction about PCA. So yeah, so PCA is like a dimensionality reduction technique as I'm, um, so there are like so many features as we have seen, but like not all the features have the important information. So we just, PCA helps to reduce these number of dimensions or features and it retains only the useful information in the data. So it's an unsupervised technique. So it does not know anything about the input data. It doesn't know if there's like any groupings between the data. It just helps us to see like how the data is spread. So that like, finally we get a plot where like if the uh, scores or samples are closer together, then we say that, okay, these are similar. So when they are like far apart, maybe they are dissimilar. This is the idea behind it. So how it does it is instead of like, um, yeah, instead of um, doing it on the original variables of X and Y, now what PCA does is uh, it transforms the original variables into a new set of variables uh, that we call as principal components. And this is like, it happens by doing some linear combinations of the actual variables and it uh, uses some equilibrium distance. I don't want to go behind the math. So to be simply said, like what it does is, for example, in this graph, so if this is our data spread, if this is how our data is spread, you see that the maximum variance is along this direction. That's where like you can see the maximum variation. So when we fit a line, like throughout, like through the origin, it perfectly fits uh, yeah, it perfectly kind of fits in here along this maximum variation direction. And this one, we will call it as our principal component one. So PC1 will be the one with, uh, which shows the maximum variation. And then comes the other PCs. So yeah, I'm not going to go over that. And now we will have our new like axes like PC1 and PC2. Of course, there are so many principal components, but for the ease of visualization, we are just using the first two PCs, PC1 and PC2, for example. And PCOA, principal coordinate analysis, is kind of the same as uh, similar to PCA, but it uses a different uh, distance metrics to calculate it. It uses like breaker test, we use breaker test distance metrics. So here, like, um, since it is based on the so instead of correlation here, we say that uh, we are calculating the distances and these dis distances are converted into a 2D graph. 
So the same, like when these two points are close together, they are similar. And if they are like far apart, they are like dissimilar is the idea behind it. So now, since I've talked a little bit about like the PCA, I would again go back and perform these like cells. So what I'm doing here is that I'm just arranging the row names um, in, of my metadata and the column names of my fitch table in the same way. Before that, ah, okay, yeah. So I run it and I also check the data sparsity in my data, like which says that how many um, amount of zeros there's in my data. And it says zero because we did imputation, so there are no zeros in the data and like, yeah, the column names and the row names are in perfect order so that we can pull around now. So now I'm going to subset the metadata based on a particular condition. Let's say I'm just taking attribute sample type two. And then it, it, there are like two levels in there with treatment and without treatment and enter the IDs of conditions you wanna keep. So I wanna keep both. I wanna look into both of the conditions. So now it's done. So this cell, I just called it from the normalized uh, data. So this is like without subsetting, but I'm just keeping it now since this is the one which calls it with the row names. So you can basically just keep that cell and it has run. So also enter the index of your interested attribute for a visualization. So I'm just going to call two, which is the attribute sample type, as we have seen earlier. And now we can see the PCOA plot with and without treatment. So these are like with treatment, and these are like the without treatment, which is our control. And then we can do permanova. So I would again go back to the slides, explaining a little bit about permanova. And yeah, one more thing I wanted to mention is that there are like these links provided, StatQuest YouTube page. You guys can go check it. They explained it much better than me. And so yeah, Permanova, it's a non-permutational multivariate analysis of variance. So it's a non-parametric test. So kind of like unsupervised. So it does not uh, rely on the data distribution. And here, like we are, um, trying to find, so with PC plot, you see that there are like different clusters. Sometimes you might run into a condition where like these clusters may be overlapping. So how significant is this difference is what we wanna see. So we are assuming this null hypothesis where we think, where we say that the centroids of all these clusters are kind of like equivalent. Whereas the alternative hypothesis is that they're like different and they're different groups, so and so. So we use some calculations and we um, run this and um, I mean, we run this Pamanova test and we get these results. So some general rule is that when your probability is, sorry, when your probability is less than 0 0.05, it's significant. And also this R square um, score gives you like, for example, if it's 0 0.44, that means like 44%. So 44% significant differences among the different groups. So yeah, this is, I guess, the information about Pomanova. And then let's go back. And also Pomanova, it, it, it like works with the distance mat mat matrix. So it's better if you do it after like PCA or PCOA. So it uses the same distance matrix. And we are doing it with 999 permutations. So, and we're using breaker as distance. So permutation is like, um, it just means like arranging your data. So it's like arranging your data in 999 ways. So you get this for this attribute sample type. So we are getting 0 0.44. This value for R2, which means that 44% differences between this with treatment and without treatment. We can also include this information into our PCOA plot 
and just simply specify it as, okay, the prob probability is 0 0.001 and this R2 value is 0 0.44. So this way you also get an idea. And you can also save your plot, which we can also see it here that it's been saved as a SVG plot. I've left some details, Daniel, I guess you can fill in. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Absir. And yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, for, for joining. Um, this was, the, as I said, like the last uh, round before the summer break. Um, I hope uh, it has become a little bit more clear how after feature finding and like all like this annotation steps, we can clean up um, our like feature table and then perform like some first multivariate analysis steps. So now this has been, of course, like a very simplified way. And I know there's many different ways other people do more sophisticated things for normalization and so on. You might want to consider, but I hope um, that at least like this intro uh, showed you nicely how you can actually start manipulating it. And it can be as simple as an Excel and obviously more um, advanced in like uh, Python or, or R as, as Apps are just um, showcased you. So yeah, with that, uh, thanks again. I hope uh, we will see you back in the winter semester. And yeah, thanks again and uh, see you around.